Hello, welcome to the Liberty Church of Christ, where we are going through the Bible. And tonight, we're on lesson number 63. So, get your Bibles and turn to Amos, as we look at those nine chapters. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we're so grateful for all the blessings that you have given to us. We realize, Father, that you are the one and only true God. We realize that you have given your word to make our lives better and to prepare us for the life to come. We look forward to seeing you, Lord, and we know that your promises are to be honored and to be trusted. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We are in the 12 minor prophets, and remember, they're only called minor because they're shorter. The other prophets were a bit longer. Now, if you need your handout where we listed the 12 minor prophets and we put a little excerpt of what they're all about, then uh, give me your email address or um, pay a visit to the website, and, and it's free. So all you have to do is download it off of that and get that uh, handout. We also have the kings chart that these prophets are listed on, and you can see which kings they were uh, contemporary with. And we're going to see tonight that Amos is contemporary with certain kings. Now, Amos is going to prophesy about 810 years before Christ, all the way to about 785 years before Christ. Now, some put that at 760 years before Christ, but it's in that general range. And what you'll see if you have your king's chart, you'll notice that he's contemporary with a Hosea. Hosea that we've already studied in the 12 minor prophets and uh, Amos are preaching to the same group of people. They're preaching to the northern kingdom of Israel, and they're preaching the same thing. Repent, or God's going to send the Assyrians in here, Damascus and the Syrians, and going to bring them in to take you away captivity. So they're calling for national repentance. And according to the dates, if you look at your king's chart, you'll see that Amos is probably toward the end of Jonah and Joel's ministry, and they're probably at the beginning of Isaiah and Micah's uh, time frame. So they're kind of sandwiched there uh, uh, by themselves, but yet they're in amongst these other prophets that are preaching to other people. Hosea and uh, Amos are preaching to the northern kingdom. But now we're going to see uh, shortly that Amos is not from the northern kingdom. And we'll see that as we go along. Let's look at chapter number one of Amos in verse number one. It tells us when he preached. It tells us where he uh, was from. And it also tells us who he preached to. So let's read that verse one together. The words of Amos, who was among the herd men of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam. That would be Jeroboam the second. Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Now, Tekoa, that is a city that is located, if you look at your map, Google it, you'll see that it is south of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is the capital of Judah, the southern kingdom. So, Amos is from the south, but yet he's called by God to go up north to Israel. That's what that verse said. It's the uh, prophecy, the words that he got from God concerning Israel. Now, he is a southern boy that is called to go up north to preach to those northerners that they need to repent or they'll be carried away captivity. Now look at the king's chart and you'll see uh, the kings as well. He named the king of Judah, Uzziah, and he named the king of Israel there, uh, Jeroboam, which is Jeroboam II, the son of Joash. And you'll see that in your king's chart. But that's uh, where he's from, from the south, and who he's talking to, the people of the north, Israel, and the date that he's talking to. And you'll see those dates as you look at the king's chart. 
But notice he said something interesting. Two years before the earthquake. Now, Judah and Israel have had many earthquakes, uh, just like many other parts of the world. But there's a significant earthquake that took place along about this time. And you can do your own research to find out which earthquake you think that he's talking about. But it was an earthquake that everybody would be familiar with. It's sort of like 9-11. If I say this was two years before 9-11, everybody would understand uh, that is keeping up with current events and historical events that 9-11 is a, is a marker that changed the course of uh, the way we live. Well, that's the way this earthquake was. He said it was two years before the earthquake that everybody that he's writing to would fully understand what earthquake he's talking about because it was life-changing. Now, keep this in mind, too. He said it's two years before the earthquake, which means that the earthquake had to already have happened, and he is reflecting. So when he's writing this, he's talking about something that happened in his past. It happened two years before the earthquake. If I were to say, uh, this happened in my life a year before 9-11, then it happened after 9-11, because I wouldn't have known it, it was a year before 9-11. But anyway, this is uh, Amos' putting his historical framework on his writing. Let's skip for just a minute to Amos chapter 7. Everybody flip over there. We're going to come back to chapter 1 and make our way through the nine chapters. But let's take a peek at Amos chapter 7 to give us a better understanding of Amos himself. Look at verse 14. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, Amaziah, A-M-A-Z-I-A-H, however you pronounce that. Here's what he said. I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herd man and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Look at verse 15 of chapter 7. The Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, uh, Go and prophesy unto my people Israel. So, Amos right there testifies, I'm not even a prophet. I'm a, I'm a, a shepherd, and I gather sycamore fruit. But right there in the middle of my job, God just tapped me on the shoulder and told me that I had to go to Israel and preach. And I did. And that's exactly what Amos did. And he is preaching with fervor. Now let's go back to chapter 1. Before he gets to the prophecy to the people of Israel, he's going to give some prophecy to other countries. And he names them Damascus. He says some things about them. Gaza. Tyrus, which sits at the uh, coast of the Mediterranean Sea with Zidon. And then he talks about the Edomites. He says, I'm prophesying to Edom. And the Ammonites, he's prophesying to Ammon. Now go to chapter 2, and he mentions two others that he's prophesying to. The Moabites and Judah. So his own hometown, he has something to say to them as well. But then he gets into the prophecy against Israel in chapter 2, verse number 6. Now, notice that at the beginning of every one of those prophecies from Damascus, Gaza, Judah, all of those, he says this, for three transgressions and for four. He says the same thing to Israel, for three transgressions, that's sins. And then he goes on to say, and for four, which means you've got so many transgressions, they can't even all be counted. So Israel, you are just in the same basket with all these other countries that are sinning against God. And in verse number 13, he says this in chapter number 2, Behold, this is God talking, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. So being a farmer and a herdman, he wouldn't know what that looked like. A bunch of sheaves on a cart is pressed down on that cart. God says, Israel, 
you burden me. I'm pressed under you, just like that cart under a load of sheaves. You are burdening me. And, of course, they were burdened God. Amos, his name himself, means burden. Burden bearer. So when Amos walks into the room, people look at him and say, Amos, or burden, burden bearer. Well, Amos is a burden bearer. He has a burden that he is carrying over to Israel. It's a burden that God has placed on him because God is burdened and he wants to prophesy and preach to the people of Israel. Look at chapter number three and look at verse two. God is going to tell uh, Israel that unlike these other countries, God has chosen them. They're special to God. And these other countries, he kind of anticipated that they would uh, fall away and have to be punished. But not you. You are God's people. Why are you falling away? But you did. And you are. So I'm going to punish you too. I'll put you in the same basket with those foreign countries if you don't repent. But there's good news. Look at chapter 3, verse number 12. Thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed, and in Damascus in a couch. Even though you're going to be carried away into Samaria or Israel, the Assyrians, Damascus area, even though you're going to be carried away captive, just like a shepherd loves his sheep, he'll go to that lion that grabbed that sheep out of the flock, and he will defeat the lion, and, and he will pull back the pieces of his own sheep whether it's two legs or an ear or whatever, he'll rescue them. Well, that's what God offers. I'm going to allow you to be punished, but just like a shepherd loves his sheep, I will pull you out in pieces. I will rescue you, even if it is in pieces, because I love you. Chapter number four, in verse number 11, beginning, here's what he says. I'm going to give you a warning. I have overthrown some of you, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you remember what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what's going to happen to Israel if they don't repent. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, and pulled him out of the fire. Yet, even though I saved you, have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Look at verse 12 of chapter 4. Therefore, because you didn't return to me, even though I saved you, Thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, listen, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Punishment's coming. The day of the Lord's coming. We talked about that last time with Joel. The day of the Lord's coming. Prepare to meet your God. If you don't repent, you will be carried away captive. Look at chapter 5. Skip down to verse number 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and you shall live. You see, he's still offering hope. Even though they've sinned, even, and he gave a whole list of their sins. As you read these chapters, you'll see what all they're guilty of. But he says, if you will just turn back and seek me, then you will live. You will not die. That's hope. That's what God gives. But right now, they're not seeking God. And they won't, because history tells us in 722 B.C., which is about 40 to 60 years after Amos prophesies, uh, they'll be carried away into Assyrian captivity. But right now, even though he offered them hope, uh, he is telling them that their, their sins are making him sick. Because these people uh, will worship God in the ceremonies, even though they go out and do bad things. Isn't that the way it is sometimes, even under the New Testament, uh, where we have Christ as our king and priest? We'll go to church on Sunday, and we'll sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And we'll take communion, and we'll pray, and we'll listen to a message from God's Word. But then we go out on Monday and live like 
a, a, a sinner. God says, well, when you do that, your worship stinks. I, I don't appreciate your worship. Look what he says in Amos 5, verse 21. I hate, I despise your feast days. Now remember, God told them how to worship him and with all these feast days in the Old Testament. But he says, even though you're doing what I told you to do, I still hate it. He says, I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. And that smell is that savor, that sweet-smelling savor of worship. God said, I won't accept it. It stinks to me. And that's what happens when we go to church on Sunday and we tell God how much we love Him, but yet we're living a, a sinful life. God says, even though you're doing what I told you to do, even though you're going to church, it, that worship stinks to me. Look at chapter 6, verse number 1. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. You guys are just taking it easy, and you think you got it made in the shade, but you're but you're not doing right. Uh, even this worship that you're giving me is feast days. It's what I told you to do, but you're doing it improperly. Uh, and you're going to the mountains of Samaria. Do you remember the Samaritan woman at the well in the New Testament? Jesus had a conversation with a Samaritan woman. And the Samaritan woman challenged Jesus. And she said, well, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. And we've got a lot of disagreements you Jews don't like we Samaritans. But one big religious disagreement we have is that you Jews, Jesus, worship in the temple in Jerusalem. But we Samaritans worship in the mountains, just like uh, God mentioned here in Amos. And Jesus looked at that woman and told her, you're wrong. It's not right for you to worship in the mountains. We Jews, we know the truth. And Worshiping in the temple in Jerusalem is the truth. But he goes on to tell her, but there's a day coming, and now is. What? That it doesn't matter where you worship, whether you're in the mountains, where you're in Jerusalem, as long as you worship in spirit and in truth. That's the hope that has come to us as Christians, as Gentiles. See, we're not Jewish, and we're not under the Jewish law. And we're not bound to worship in Jerusalem at a specific temple. We are children of God as Christians. And we worship in spirit and in truth. Let's skip on down to verse number 4 of chapter 6. He says, not only are you at ease in Zion, back up in verse 1. In chapter of, uh, 6 verse 4, he says, you lie upon beds of ivory. Oh, you're rich and you, you're relaxed and it's beds of ivory. You think you got it made. You stretch yourselves upon the couches. You eat the lambs out of the flock, the calves out of the midst of the stall. You got the best food that you could possibly need. He says in verse 5, you chant in the sound of a viol and invent to yourself instruments of music like David. You're just relaxed and you're just going through the motions and you think you got it made. But he started out in verse number one, woe to them. And it's not good that you're, you're turning your worship into something that is pleasing to yourself and not something that you're honoring and worshiping God. But look at chapter number seven. There's a priest in town. His name is Amaziah. Try to pronounce that earlier. And Amaziah, and that's how I'll pronounce it, Amaziah, he sent word to Jeroboam, that's Jeroboam II, the king of Israel. And he said, there's a prophet in town. His name is Amos. And he is stirring the people up. The people can't bear his words. He's preaching things that are bothering everybody. What is he preaching? I'll tell you what he's preaching. He is saying that you, Jeroboam, the king, our king, will be killed with a sword. And he's saying that we, as a nation, will be carried away into captivity by strangers out of our land. Well, that's true. 
everything that Amaziah said that Amos was preaching is exactly what Amos was preaching. And Amos was preaching it because it was the truth. But yet Amaziah didn't like it, even though he's a priest of God. He said, I don't care for it. I don't want to hear it. And then he turned to Amos and he told Amos to quit preaching. Oh, that's what a lot of people do today. Uh, you'll tell the truth. And even preachers, people that say they love Jesus, people that say they're, they're Christians, they don't want to hear it. They would rather preach what they want to preach. They, they, people that has itching ears and they, they want to hear what they want to hear. But these preachers are happy to tell them. Uh, they don't want to hear the truth. Well, Amos tells Amaziah, look, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I'm a, a, a shepherd. I gather sycamore fruit also. But one day, God, that wasn't my plan. It was God's plan. He tapped me on the shoulder and told me, told me to go preach. That's exactly what I'm doing. If you're going to get mad at somebody, don't be mad at me. Be mad at God. Well, in chapter 8, God shows Amos a basket of summer fruit. Now, that's the end of the harvest. And he said, that's what I'm trying to represent to you in this, showing you this basket. What? That we are going to see the end of Israel. That's the end of the summer harvest, end of the fruit, uh, summer fruit. This is the end of Israel. It's going to happen. And then in chapter 8, he gave a whole list of things that Israel are doing wrong and that they deserve punishment for. And then finally, in chapter number 9, God spent the first 10 verses of chapter 9 telling Israel that they can't escape his wrath. They can go up to the heaven, he'll bring them down. They can go down in the earth, he'll bring them up. No matter where they go or how they try to escape God, they can't. He's going to destroy them. That's what he tells them in the first 10 verses. But beginning in verse 11, he changes and he gives them hope. And he tells them that something good is going to happen in the by and by. Well, listen to verse number 11 of chapter 9. In that day, Will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof? And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as the, in the days of old. Look at verse 12. That they may possess the remnant of Eden and of all the heathen, that's Gentiles, which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doth this. God's doing this. Now we look at that and a lot of people will pull it out of their context. So, oh, well, uh, he's talking about restoring Israel, his people to a place on earth and everything's going to be fine with the people of Israel, literally. But we don't have to guess about this. We're told what it means and it's something spiritual. He's using the physical example of Israel to portray a spiritual intention that he has. And that is that not only the Jews are going to be the people of God that's going to be gathered under the authority of God, the Jews and the Gentiles can come together in the church. The tabernacle of the Old Testament Jews represents the church of the New Testament Christians. And not just one people can be gathered into the church. Jews and Gentiles alike now, how do we know that? How can we be sure that he's talking about the gathering in of the Gentiles and the Jews? Because in Acts chapter number 15, everybody go there in your Bible. Flip to Acts chapter 15. This is where they're having a big council in Jerusalem in the Christian age. Jesus has died on the cross. He's resurrected. He's sent to heaven. The church was established in Acts chapter 2, and the church is growing. It's expanding. It's, it's uh, spreading throughout the countries. And there's a group of Gentiles, a large number of them, that want to come in to the church. And Jews are saying, I don't know if we want that to happen or not, unless you become Jew first. Then you can become a Christian. So they had a big meeting in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. Peter gave his story of 
how he has baptized Cornelius, the first Gentile uh, Christian that became, became a Christian. And then uh, Paul and Barnabas told their story of how they went through missionary journey and baptized a lot of Gentiles. Well, the half-brother of Jesus stands up. That's James. It's not James, one of the apostles. Uh, James, by that time, one of the apostles already dead, killed with a sword. But James, the half-brother of Jesus, stands up, and he makes a statement. He says, I believe that we need to let the Gentiles come in, and I believe that God has already said so. How did he know? Well, he quoted Amos, this very verse. Look at Acts 15, beginning at verse 16. Simon Peter had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. Well, what does it mean as it is written? It's written in Amos. And he quotes this. He says, After this I will return, I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, set the Lord, who does all these things. So he quoted Amos to say that God is meaning that Jews and Gentiles will be combined under the new covenant, Christianity. And then James just has to worship God a little bit. He says in verse 18 of Acts chapter 15, Known unto God are all of his works from the beginning of the world. God already knew that he was going to be doing this, and he let us know that in Amos. Well, we can see there at the end of chapter 9 that Amos, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is offering hope. Folks, you and I have hope. It doesn't matter how far away from God that we have gotten, and many people have. Many people have gotten so far away from God that they think that they can't come back. That's just not true. They can come back. God wants them to come back. Seek me and you shall live. And we certainly can come back and be a part of the church because of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for being with us in this study tonight. And uh, we're going to study, Lord willing, next week we'll look at Jonah and Nahum. So go ahead and study those two together. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be together tonight and to study your word. We pray that you will help us to always understand that you are God and that as long as we seek you, we have the promise that we will live. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord willing, we'll see you next week.